So, are you all comfortable and good and... I, I feel a bit overdressed. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was me who was yeah. overdressed, actually. I got a, a compliment from uh, our national team coach that I was the best dressed person in... Of course! <laughs> <laughs> and you also have a name on the back. Yeah. Kevin, can I you say that? I wore this to Amsterdam in September. So we have a, a quiz here. Can you say her name? Yeah, it's very simple. It's Halla. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's it sounds Remembering that David and myself played when we didn't have names on the back of the shirts because we, we, we knew we were. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, so uh, if, you, if you lose yourself, Hatlau, you at least you have your name in the back now. Exactly. <laughs> Let's start this. We, we, uh, we're talking about team building here. And we have, as you can see, uh, our panel. We have experts from the football field, but we also have experts from the business field. A little bit, let's move from the football in towards business. So, Kevin, uh, no, first of all, so, sorry. David Moyes, uh, in you, you have an extensive experience as a football manager. Mm -hmm. What are the key points in, in building up stream te a strong team, in, in your opinion? Well, first of all, I'm a football man, and I didn't think I was a businessman. Okay. Until I went into really serious football business, when you understand that you can't just be the football coach and the manager, which I want to be. <laughs> I want to take the training, I want to be involved with the, with the football, watch the games, but there's another side about managing up the way, about managing with the directors, with the chairman or president, whatever it may be. And I had to learn that very quickly as a young coach, that it wasn't about just the things I wanted to do. Mm. So uh, just a couple of examples I got very early on were from really uh, good men who gave me good advice at a young age and I followed the plans, I followed their thoughts, I had to take notes regular on, on all my staff. Every three months I had to evaluate all my staff. So after two years I had an evaluation of, the, of all the players mm -hmm. and my staff and he would look at it. He also used to tell me, David, only buy young players. And I thought, but I want a big O, I want an old one who scored me 30 goals. He says, David, always take the young ones because you will have resale, you'll have money. So from me being, I would say, not a business person at all, starting your team uh, from the basic, from the bottom level, I got simple good advice from a very good man and uh, I use that advice and I still use it today. So building up strong team from, from, the, from the scratch? From scratch is very difficult for mm. MD, but it comes from being a strong leader, mm. having a, a focus, a, a desire, <coughs> and I was very driven in my job to be, to be as good as I could be when I was younger and, and still am. But I think that then will filter down through, through your business and through your, your club. Okay, thank you. Um, Kevin, you have an amazing experience, and I know some of the boys here, they have actually a man crush on you. Um, yeah, pictures of me. Um, They've got pictures of me on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit corny. Probably yeah. cheaper than wallpaper, I guess. <laughs> some girls too. So yeah. Some girls too. That's good to know. Thank you. <laughs> Just helping you out. Yeah. Can you give us some insight on the role of the of the team leader in in different and and a little bit in different roles in the team? Yeah, I mean, the thing where we can connect with business, which is what today's all about is that people think football is, is just a game that you play and things happen but there's a lot of decisions a lot of things that you have to do that, that right David said you know there's no university to go and learn to be a football manager you know the, there isn't you can go and take the coaching courses which you've done here in Iceland and, and, and that's why I think we talked about it on the first panel 20 years of investment or 15 years of investment has got you where you are now. The people in those days made decisions. And, you know, we're slightly different to business, aren't we, David, in that, you know, we, nev we go in at zero, but it it it's never really zero. We when a manager goes into a football club, it's because that club is usually having problems. So you're going into a, a bit of a crisis. So you become a firefighter. You have to quickly assess what you have around you. 
but it's the same as you have in your business. You, you have a lot of different characters. If you've got eight or 10 people in your team, it, there are eight or 10 different characters. You know, one guy might be strong at engineering. The girl might be very, very good at organizing. And it's how you pull those things together. And I always think in football terms, if we, every team I played in that was successful, the Liverpool team, the Hamburg team, uh, the England team for a little while, and even the Southampton team when, in, later in my career, we had one thing in common all the time. We had four or five leaders in the 11. Not one, not two, four or five leaders. And then when you have that in a football team or in a business, good leaders who pass things on, who, who are not saying to the, everybody, look, this is how I do it, do it as I do, but actually sometimes giving them the chance to show you that actually they can do it as well. And that's what I learned a lot when I went into management, because I just went from playing golf in Marbella <laughs> to running Newcastle United. And I mean, just literally, I'd seen one game. So you then have to build around people, which you have to in business. So it's very similar. The difference is we're judged every week when the league table goes up. And you in business, maybe, I think in England, you have to put your figures in every six months. You've got a little bit more time. We're judged instantly. But uh, the similarities we'll get to uh, are there for all to see. This is <coughs> actually pretty amazing in the business context because you're talking about many leaders. Uh, mm. uh, uh, that's a point I like to, to jump in later because uh, we want to start a little bit with all our panelists and give them some, some room now. Mm -hmm. Hatla, you, have, uh, you are an experienced in leading international or being a part of a leading management in international mm -hmm. company and also in a startup. Uh, give us a little insight. How, how, in your mind, how do you build up small teams to think big? Yeah, I think, uh, actually, I would like to build a little bit on what Kevin said, but um, we also start at ground zero when we're entrepreneurs, and I've been in that situation uh, numerous times. And I think it's all about the same thing in football and business. You have to unite people around a clear purpose, a mission. And in football, that may be clear, because you're there to win a very clear game. But in business... Um, that why, mm. why we are here, mm. often has to be really well articulated by the leadership and really well communicated constantly to the people because it's not always as clear as market share or something else in a startup. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm a big believer in uniting people around a clear purpose and that purpose ideally needs to be very <coughs> differentiated from what everybody else in, is doing in your sector. But I'm also a big believer in whatever you're starting uh, is humility or humbleness. And uh, uh, maybe we will go back to that. And I think David was mentioning that. And that is um, the best teams, whether it be in football or in business, they have that humbleness to allow everybody to be good. When you have teams where there are superstars who think and act like they are better than anybody else and are carrying the team and they are actually indispensable, I think you have bad teams. And I think my favorite stories from football are the Greek national team in the Euro 2004, really took us by surprise, but I really think they showed that element of having a team uh, that was humble and, and had sort of a, not a single star or a few single stars that stood out. And I also would like to compliment our Icelandic national team for the very same quality, and I think they've done well uh, because of that. Yeah, the focus on the team. Focus yeah. on the yeah. team, yeah. everybody yeah. matters, everybody plays a role, <coughs> and allowing everybody to live up to their fullest on a team mm -hmm. takes a lot of leaders. Yeah. Ideally, everyone is a leader on a team like that. So Andre, you are the CEO of one of the oldest and beloved company in Iceland, and you've been getting some amazing results. How have you been building up your team, and, and how important is the goal setting in your experience? Well, <coughs> the background is a little bit, it's a, it's a company that was founded in uh, 1913, so it uh, has a long, long history. Uh, I joined the company in 2002. At that time, it was turning over around maybe three, four billion kroner. Now it's turning over maybe 22 billion. So it's grown a lot. Mm. When I'm being asked, you know, what's the competitive advantage that Elkirin has? I say it's the corporate culture. It's the winning mentality. And that is the core element of every leader. Mm -hmm. It has to work with the people. Mm. It's not about the product. It's not about buying the best players. It's about, you know, 
uh, working with their minds and creating the game, as, as Hadler was mentioning. In business, it's, it's not quite clear all the time, you know, why are we here? You know, mm -hmm. Are we just selling Pepsi or, you know, wh what's the purpose here? Uh, so I often create and visualize the goals. Uh, for example, in 2006, I, I said, guys, you know, this time, you know, we are m much smaller than the competition. The evil empire, the Coca-Cola bottler, sometimes we call him Evil Fell. <laughs> it's a Evil Fell in Icelandic, yeah. but anyhow, you create a, a clear enemy, and, and then you create a, and visualize the goal. And that was a very simple mission. I said, you know, when you're punching the keyboard, remember uh, the button in the upper left corner, the ESE, the escape button, ales, star and coke, ales bigger than coke. <laughs> And um, so every time she punched the keyboard, you know, okay, that's our mission. And we, you know, we, get, we got that call in, in, in two years' time. After that, you know, you have to create a new game. Mm. So what's the new game? Pepsi bigger than Coke. Uh, that's a massive mission, of course, with mm. Coke being the, the one of the greatest brands in the world, the most valuable. But we are still there, growing from 15% up to 43%. We're not there yet, but it's clear, you know, where we're heading. Winning mentality. Winning mentality. That's, that's the core. Mm. Because when, you're, when we are in business, uh, because we're now already we've talked about the why. Mm. Uh, so when you have a business team together and, and you sh you're asking, you know, why should we be getting so crazy in our eyes and in our minds and in our passionately blood to, to, to win towards a certain goal? And, uh, and it's a little different from, from the football because the why is pr probably uh, pretty clear there. Mm -hmm. uh, if we stay a little bit uh, on this, uh, how important in your mind is uh, th this, the, the, play f the playing around the core why and towards the goal? Because you, you, Andre, you said winning Coca-Cola or getting bigger than Coca-Cola, but then mm -hmm. there are techniques to, to, to manage this. If we, if we go a little bit to you, mm -hmm. uh, David, uh, what is your view on this? Well, I <coughs> excuse me, I do think, uh, one thing, I, can I just say this? He just said that they always try to be better than Coca-Cola. Mm. I was always trying to be better than Liverpool when I was at Everton. Mm. So, so I had... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And actually, if you'd look, I think we finished above them in my last two years at Everton. So that was, that was enough. Uh. But, but I think actually having the team, picking and choosing the right people mm. who you can influence and who you can trust and won't let you down, it gives you a chance for you to develop. And because being the leader means that you want to be involved in everything. Mm. But there has to be times when you do delegate and you pass things on. Mm. And as well as that, you want them to take some ownership off it as well. So for example, Kevin talked about the leaders in the team. You, div you found out who the leaders were. You gave them some responsibility, go on. So football has got that. But business, I'm sure, you have to have the same in your business where you've got people you can trust, which will allow you to say, I can take it on. I can trust the people to do that. Let me try the next bit. Let me try to get to the next level. And I, over the years, have found that picking the correct assistants, uh, people to work around you, I think is really important. Mm. So it's people, people, people. Mm -hmm. I think also the, the, the word you use all the time, we've all used it, is trust. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's it's such a small word, you know. And when you look at it, T R U S T, they're all joined together in the alphabet, in the English one anyway. I don't know about oh. yours over here. I'm still trying <laughs> to learn the language. <laughs> yeah. But it, that is the key to any successful business that you trust the people you win. And on a football field, mm. when you're a player, you have to trust in those guys you're playing to give you the right ball at the right time to look after your back when you're in a difficult situation. Mm. As a manager. You, you have to have the same trust. We talk about leaders. Leaders, actually, really good leaders, they don't dictate to people, they show people by the way they do it. That's what we learned at Liverpool. Mm -hmm. That's why we dominated Everton for so long, David, all those years. Yeah. <laughs> before you came, yeah, yeah. before you came. <laughs> because a guy called Bill Shankly, you know, it, we didn't learn football as the main thing at Liverpool. And, and it took me a long time to realize this. We learned about life. You know, if you threw the jersey on the floor, one of the guys would say, hey, pick that up, or Betty's got to do that, you know? Mm -hmm. it, it, and you, Bill Shankly said, if I was a road sweeper in Liverpool, I would want my road to be the cleanest. 
You know, in other words, if you're going to do something, guys, mm. do it properly with all your heart. Mm. And those are the things you learn. Football was just a game we played. But what we learned in life, mm. you know, do you realize how lucky you are to play for these people? We, we did. We, we, we were privileged. And so when you build things like that, you, your boys become men. You, you leaders go because they get old. They, they re have to retire, sadly, at 33, 34 in our game. If you're looking, a goalkeeper, maybe 40. But then the other leaders come. And that's when you know you've got a great club because it, it, it's the attitude right throughout. You know, they're coming along. They're not just saying, oh, well, John Terry's gone at Chelsea. That's going to collapse. Who's the next leader at Chelsea? That's where I want to know. What has he left and the coach has left? All the coaches they've had behind. Because that, that's why I think this year... Leicester have won the league. They've been fantastic and so well organized, and all the others have almost fallen out with themselves, you know? And it's a fantastic thing, and that's why I'm, I'm working out for Iceland that you're going to win the Euros. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, a really simple theory, deadly quick. You know, when Denmark won it, they didn't even qualify. Uh, Yugoslavia had to pull out, so they went off the beach and won it. That was in 92. In 2004, your favorite team, Greece. Mm. They won it, mm. and we're 12 years on. Iceland are going to win it. I don't know how, but you're going to win it. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, have you bought Yay. the tickets? It's going to be 12 years. <laughs> you put me in a real dilemma because I have tickets to all the games, but I'm running for president. So now <laughs> I might just forget, uh, forget, yeah, the, forget, the forget the presidency because this is know. more important. <laughs> this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I, you I, have. Uh, I, I think you're right. I'm uh. actually going to at least see Portugal. But I have to build on what you just said because I think you mentioned something very important for football, for business, and for society. It's called trust. And everybody knows when it's missing that nothing works. And I think, and unfortunately, we know that in Icelandic society today, but on our football team, we have it. Um, and I think, how do you, so you mentioned the why. We've yeah. all said you have to know why you're here. And then Andre mentioned the goal. We have to know where we're going. What keeps us on that route are principles. And I think that's what you're talking about, about you know, the, the principles and the values that lead the way. And I think those are so important ingredient in any successful team. Because even if you know the why, and even if you have a very aggressive goal, if you're willing to get there any way you can um, just to win, that's going to be a short-term strategy. A long-term strategy is rooted on principles, and um, I think, you know, are you going to bite other players is a question you'd ask in football. Uh, are you going to be a good corporate citizen you'd ask in business? Are you going to take responsibility for society that you operate in and for the environment that you work in in general? So I'm sort of for profit people planet approach to business and, and to anything, meaning that I think you can't just focus on the goal. You have to focus on the why and the principle that keep you on track, mm -hmm. and that's how you build trust. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would like to get a little bit your view on taking this a little further, Andre, to the motivation of it, mm -hmm. because you talked about uh, how you visualize it. Can you give it a little in better insight on how you build up that, I wanted to say horniness, can I say that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's like okay. the horny salmon okay. going upstream, yeah, no? It's, it's okay. It <laughs> it's just okay. gets censored when it goes on TV. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not running for the president, so it's okay. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> I'm not either. Since uh, okay, I, I can take that. Then I also would like to take it a little bit further, that uh, what Kevin was saying and, and Hatla. Uh, you know, the core values of the companies are, are so important, and the core values of every team is so important. It, it's a certain guideline, and you need to, as a leader, you need to convey the message constantly. It's not something that is you know, nice to have on the wall. You have to walk the talk, and you have to really point out and, and learn and, and, and draw decisions you know, from that. Also, you mentioned trust. That's a key essence. And passion. You mentioned passion. And that is a key element, I think, in, in the, let's say, the winning spirit. To build passion about the business, to build passion behind your brands and what you're doing. And uh, this is what we've been doing, for example, with our beers. I mean, a few years ago, and uh, you know, we were like uh, the underdogs in beers. We had like 20, 25% market share. Now, in, in five years' time, it's grown to uh, about 50%. And how do we do it? By creating you know, the, the passion and the ambition and to visualize the, the clear goal, that was ESB, which means mm. AIDS biggest in beer. Mm. And, uh, and we kind of, you know, we visualize it. We make logos out of everything, you know. And, you know, 
as soon as I mention ESB and show the sign, everybody knows, you know, yeah, we're, we're, we're going to be the biggest in beers, you know, and we have the passion. And, and, and that's the way, you know, we do it. We, we try to have, you know, as many visual goals as we can. Uh, we are implementing now visual management. I divided all my 400 employees into teams that meets weekly and they have their, you know, billboards, they have visual management. So uh, I strongly believe in, you know, conveying messages not only by words but also mm. by having them directly in front of them. Mm. Thank you. That, and this also comes back to what Senor Calderón said this morning mm. about what we saw in the, in the Madrid, uh, the little hidden messages. It's very visual, so it comes into your mind. Mm -hmm. Taking this a little further, we're talking about the why, the goals, the, the motivation, management style. Mm -hmm. You're the expert, aren't you? Oh, oh <laughs> a lot of Man United supporters would say no. <laughs> uh, let me just say what I, I was going to I was thinking about something when I was listening to Kevin and, and the panel speaking there. Saying the biggest thing for a leader is to be honest. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about saying is to be honest because staff like people who are honest. No, they don't like people who tell untruths or don't tell it straight. But let me tell you, there's a great saying about honesty. If you're honest, you will be disliked. So you cannot be honest and not be disliked. And I tried to take up my management style was to be as honest as it was. But if there was a player who wasn't good enough, or if there was a business colleague who wasn't good enough, you either had to tell them, it was up to them to correct it, fix it, do what they had to do. If not, then they had to move on. So, so much for us being nice, but as we said, we need to win. And the only way I'm going to win is by getting the best team. Uh, and eventually I'm going to have to be honest, which means I'm going to be disliked somewhere along the line. And that's what I found in my management style, that I would be honest, but it probably meant quite often I wasn't going to be the most favorable person. And it wasn't a, a, a contest of being the most popular person. At the, at no. I think no. there's a close thing there though between honesty and respect. I think players, which we know best, mm -hmm. they sometimes don't mind you telling them the truth. You know, in other words, you put them in the picture. Sometimes as a manager, as a leader, you definitely have to tell white lies. I know it's a terrible thing to say, but white lies, are, as you know, are things you have to say. To, if a player comes up, you've got 30 players and you're playing 11. So you know, the secret of football management is to keep the players who hate you away from the ones who haven't quite decided yet, you know? <laughs> the 11 you pick are okay. <laughs> and, you, you, you know, so sometimes you'll tell a young player will come to you and you know in your heart of hearts, David, you've been there, I'm sure, he's probably got no chance of ever playing a big part at this club because of the standard he's at compared with the rest of the players. When he comes to you, and he asks you the question, you know, am I going to get, have I got a chance here? What do you say to him? And this is where, you know, you have to really work it out. And you always have to give him something to hang on to. Because he just might, <coughs> he just might, with the rejection, it might give him a spur. Because rejection is probably mm. one of the greatest spurs mm. in life. All the great players have been rejected. Mm. There's no doubt about that. All the great leaders have been somewhere and told you know, you're not good enough. And it's the ones who take that rejection and say, you know what, I'm going to prove you wrong. They're the ones. So rejection, tough as it is, sometimes telling the truth, David, you're yeah. right. But sometimes I'm asking it and just giving that guy, that kid, that little bit of hope and opportunity that he can jump into is fantastic. And, you know, it happened to me. I got turned down twice. And I went back to my school and the teacher said one thing to me I'll never forget. He said, right, Kevin, concentrate on you studies now because you're never going to be a footballer that was the best i've been looking for him ever since i think he's dead <laughs> <laughs> you know but i want to thank him because he didn't know it but he really inspired me he really made me achieve a lot so you know it's all those things in management it's not black it's not white it's, it's everything management it's you've got to be a father to them haven't you and next minute you've got to really let them know you know, you've done wrong there and you deserve it. And you've got to be all those things. You, you're not just one person. And sometimes you amaze yourself how hard you can be. Mm -hmm. You go home and think, wow, I hope nobody says, talks to my son like that or my daughter. <laughs> yeah. But 
That's management. And in crisis and difficult situations, yeah. as you well, well know, you can lose your temper. I did it once very well. Well, I'm going to be... Only once? <laughs> well, once that I can particularly remember, yeah. probably a lot more. <laughs> I'm going to be brutally honest in this room, and I'm probably not. I'm going to be disliked in a moment or two. Okay. And I don't want to take all this towards football because it's obviously business. I think your national team has done unbelievable. And I think that you should be incredibly proud but it's only at the bottom la run of the ladder for Iceland. This should be the start. You should go to the Euros with hope, not with an expectation that you're going to be qualifying and we should be there. You should be going there, thrilled your country's there, support your team all the way through. Mm -hmm. But to be brutally honest, if you qualify for the, through the group stages, that'll be fantastic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's me being brutally honest. <laughs> well, uh, you're, very, you're, you're very disliked yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. No, yeah. No, we don't no, like you. Exactly. Yeah. I, think the, I think the posters of Kevin are staying up. Uh, yeah. 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 That's why you're all Liverpool supporters. <laughs> over here. Well, I'm a Man U fan. Yeah. So. Well, well, I'm so a Liverpool fan. So. Yeah. But we, I should, can, I can we should <laughs> probably switch seats. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Andrew, you yeah. want to jump in? Yeah, yeah. I, I was just saying, you know, I'm so confident that, that the only actually uh, game that I'm going to see in Paris is the final match. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but I would actually like to build on what David just said because I think uh, it's important and, and one of the values we said, you know, I was part of a female team that set up an investment firm in the infamous year 2007 in Iceland and we did uh, survive the economic collapse intact and I, I, I say it's because we had a great team, timing also mattered but our principles and values really mattered. And one of them was straight talking, mm. both amongst ourselves and to our customers. And I really believe in this honesty. So we had profit and with principles as a, as a value as well, and straight talking was another one. I really, really believe that um, when it comes down to being a really good and respected leader in the long run, it is about straight talking. And I also believe that when you tell people you're not going to make it, it can be the greatest motivator. So I don't really believe that you are... I think it's false kindness to lead people on uh, to think that they are something they're not. So I think the best thing a leader does is tells people, these are your strengths, you know, work from your strengths, but these are some reasons that, you know, I don't see you in this uh, key team now, and that needs to change if you want to make it into that team. Andre, now you're the big CEO of this couch here. <laughs> Take a little bit from that point, talking about honesty in leading, mm -hmm. how do you see it? I see this as, as very important and, and also not only as a leader you have to be honest, but the whole company has to be honest mm. Mm. and uh, it has to be humble. Mm. And um, that's why, for example, we took, you know, CSR, you know, uh, like corporate social responsibility, mm -hmm. very, very seriously. And uh, we took it from the standpoint that it was not something to hang on the wall, you know. It was not only joining the global compact by the United Nations, it was actually about reinforcing it into the DNA of the company that everything that we did was thought about and it was, we considered you know, the society and everything we do. And uh, there was a lot of dis decisions we are taking every day that are taken, you know, from this perspective. Yeah, and linked into it, yeah. Exactly, yeah. so yeah. you're just, you're living it. And that's also part of creating a team with, with strong motivation. It's to open their eyes, you know, for this. You have, uh, honesty has to go all the way through. It's not mm -hmm. only about persons, it's also about the corporation. As Flying well. through Maybe. the whole thing. Yeah. Before we have a few minutes at the end of this session for Q&A, so guys get ready for, for some questions, we will have uh, five or ten minutes. But before we go into that, because we have a room full of people here who are all business people, but football fans, I would say. So what, if I ask each and one of you, what can you give them for a takeaway as we're talking about building unique team? And we start with you, Kevin. Well, you can't build a unique team without putting a lot of thought and effort into it. But w what, I, what I try to do, and this is all I can talk to you about, when I went into Newcastle, I hadn't seen a game for three years. So you go in and you assess what you've got. That's the first thing. And you, you look at the people who... You, you can build around and you they come you find them very easily in there and from from that point on then 
you must invest as much and pass on as much knowledge as you can. They want direction from you, which is very important. You know, I think you said in your little bit there, if you don't know where you're going, that's where you'll end up nowhere. And, and, and once you start to get it rolling, and I think just towards the end of the last debate, we saw it. You, you've had success here in Iceland now. People think success is fantastic. You know, success is just a ticket to, you set a standard, now you've got to keep it. You know, so when you, when you take a club up uh, from the championship as I did with Newcastle, you know, there's two things you can do. If you ever hear anybody say to you, in a football club certainly, a chairman says to you, we're going, we're going to consolidate now. That is, that is a word that should be banned because consolidate means you're not going to go anywhere. It means you're going to stay where you are. And I said to the chairman of Man City, and that's why I left, he said, we're going to consolidate now. We got up, we got to ninth, and we needed investment. And he said, we need to consolidate. The minute you consolidate in the Premier League or in a business, you don't stay. That's what people think, you stay there. You don't. The others jump over you. You know, the ones mm. that are sharper, the ones that are just doing a little bit harder work, the little bit more mean and hungry than you are, they jump over you. Mm. A prime example in England would be Newcastle at the moment and maybe Aston Villa, if you're football fans. Mm. You, can you understand how two teams like that are going to go out of the Premier League? And teams like Bournemouth, with 11,000 people, teams like Watford, it, it doesn't make sense. It wouldn't make sense in any other business. But if you get it wrong at a football club or a business, mm -hmm. the rot sets in quickly. So mm -hmm. as, as leaders, and that's what you people are here today, looking for some little bits of things that just might spark you, I, I would say to you, honestly, invest in, in, in your people mm -hmm. and trust them. Sometimes mm -hmm. they will surprise you at how good they are. You know, you think, wow, I never saw, I never gave them a chance. I never saw that in him. And if your people move on like it, from your coaching, David, a lot of your people have, if they move on to do jobs of their own, you've done a very good job because you've, you've, you've helped them go and take the next step for, for them, which is right, which is advancing their lives and their careers. So that, that, that's what I think leadership thank, is. Thank you, David. I was going to say, building team spirit. Look what Iceland have done. Look at the national mm. team. Look at Leicester City. Uh, and I'm going to draw a comparison with Ramon there. Uh, Ramon Calderon at Real Madrid. Real Madrid have never really looked like a team that have got fantastic team spirit because of the Galacticos. But what they do have over the years have had people from the base of Madrid, the heart of Madrid, the, you know, the, the people at the club who've sort of kept that. But to get the team spirit has to come from the leadership and within your business. And most of the teams I've had have had to build up a little bit from the bottom. And for me, I had to find a way of getting a team spirit, which meant I could maybe get closer to Liverpool when I was at Everton. I could maybe start to edge closer because we had a great spirit, a great belief. And I think this year, with Iceland, mm. with Leicester City, mm. I think people in business should be saying, I might not be the biggest business. I might not have the best CEO in the world. I might not have all the resources. But can I somehow find a way and get in that team spirit? And team spirit could be put in different ways. Mm -hmm. How you choose to do that comes from the leader and how the way you, you decide to make that work. But I definitely think getting that plays a big part. Team spirit. Mm -hmm. Andre? Mm -hmm. Well, for me, it's uh, a, a very important factor is to have fun. I mean, you spend a lot of time in work and you have to have fun. I'm not saying, you know, you have to be that drunk, you know, all the time and, you know, even though we're but producing beer, it's, it's quite nice. <laughs> it's quite yeah. nice. Yeah. But you need to take the moment, you need to celebrate, you know, when you're taking small victories and, and you know, that's part of it. Mm. And uh, secondly, I'm, I'm definitely not the best CEO in the world and, and uh, not in Iceland. And the key thing is to choose the team carefully mm. so that you can learn from the team. You have to choose a team or the individual members that are so strong and so clever that you can learn from them. Mm. I'm trying to be a better CEO every day, you know, by extracting their knowledge and, you know, getting their feedback because they are quite, they are sometimes brutally honest with me. Mm -hmm. And they just tell me in the face, Andre, you're really fucking things up, you know, you should <laughs> not be doing it. Yeah. So yeah, th that's key for me. Okay, thank you. And Hadla? 
Uh, I'm, I'm going to agree with team spirit, you know, hence and also having fun, so yeah. and not taking yourself too seriously. Um, I actually can relate to one of my early management experiences because I managed um, a soccer team in the south of the USA, Auburn University in Alabama. That's how I got through school. And it was the men's soccer team because they didn't have women's soccer at the time. Um, and I think I want to go back to the fact that when I got there, they had two stars, you know, somebody who ran really fast and another one who was very good at uh, scoring goals. And this team didn't work. So I started my first export business from Iceland and started I or import business in the US and started bringing in Nordic players, UK players and sort of building the team very deliberately. And it really wasn't until we had sort of a team of equals and were humble enough to recognize that it wasn't about having, you know, the great scorer and, and the one leader on the field. It was really about building camaraderie, team spirit, and, and it was sort of a long-term strategy that we started winning any games. And I really believe that deliberately building a team and looking for not just skill, but the heart that people have in it is the key to success in football, business, and in society. Perfect, thank you. So guys, we have a few minutes left when we are open for answer questions. And uh, we have some, I've, uh, I'm trying to see here. We have some microphones in, in there, uh, two or three questions, and I think we will take them all together and then let our panel answer. Any hands up? One there. One there. That's a very quiet audience. One down there. Where? Yeah, just down here. Okay, they're running. Please introduce yourself and have yeah. it. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm from Spain, but I believe in. You hear well? Yeah. Uh, uh, bienvenido a Islandia. Okay, <laughs> gracias. <laughs> I've been here 10 years in Iceland so far, and in this time I have uh, created a company that I manage, also a small football team, and also a small fan group for Atletico Madrid supporters in Iceland. <laughs> And I have a question that I think uh, it's good for David, maybe, because he has played recently against Atletico Madrid. Mm -hmm. And we are talking a lot here today about uh, having like not only one leader, but the importance of the whole team, mm -hmm. the whole group. It's very important. And even if you don't have the best resources, or in this case, the best players, you can always achieve uh, what you want. Also, like we have this year, this message uh, in Spanish, it is like, uh, si se cree, se puede, mm -hmm. if you believe, you can. And we have been like fighting a lot in the last years. And now we are for the second time in three years in the Champions League final. And I think it's, uh, uh, we're here talking about Leicester and Iceland, but this is also a clear example. Uh, so. I think it, uh, yeah, th th that was just a question for David. Uh, you think this is a clear example, Atletico Madrid, of that we are talking here before? Thank you. Yeah, I do. And, uh, you know, I, again, I just don't want to, there's a lot of business people here, but I'll quickly answer the question in football. Atletico Madrid have done incredible. And Atletico Madrid, like, there was a question earlier about the style of Icelandic football. Uh, and it's sometimes it's a little bit difficult to answer. Atletico Madrid are completely different from natural Spanish type football. All we talked about a little bit was the Spanish style. Well, Atletico Madrid are different, uh, a little bit uglier uh, in what they've done. But what they've achieved over the years on the verge of getting out of business, they had no money, what they've done, uh, and they have found a leader in Diego Simeone who's near enough the perfect fit for that company, for that business. And... Uh, they also have fantastic players now as well because they've developed through the years. So you're very lucky because your team's been in the Champions League twice mm. and uh, maybe they're after revenge against Real Madrid this time uh, after losing a couple of years ago. They, they Are you all, dying to get in? Yeah, yeah. Just, just, just to add, they're also the perfect example of a team that sell a star, but someone else comes in mm. and it's like they never lost anybody. And that tells you that yeah. as, as a group, as yeah. a... As a, as a team in this case, mm -hmm. it works. They're not relying, yes, you might score the goals, yes, you might be the guy who's got the tricks to open the doors, but you know, if you go, we'll replace you yeah. because we've got enough around you. And right. the other teams that struggle that haven't got that, mm -hmm. when the top player leaves, it, it crumbles. It's built then on, really, on one or two players, and you must never do that. Mm -hmm. uh, Liverpool, as I said to you at the start, 
you need five or six in a football team. I don't know how many you need in your company. The bigger the company, I don't know whether you need more. I don't really know enough about that. But certainly Real Madrid, as David said, is, is just a great example of a team that nothing affects it. You know, life goes on. You can, Torres can go and then they'll lose Griezmann this year probably. I'm sorry to say that. Lo siento, pero. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to lose him probably to one of the big clubs. But you'll just replace him and you'll still, and you should have won the European Cup. The other year, you just had to put a man on the post and you would have been there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Last minute. <laughs> Thank you. Any other, we have, yep, we have a hand up there. Please introduce yourself and... and My name is Peter Blontal. I'm, I'm just curious. Um, um, I would like to hear from, from uh, Keegan and Moyes maybe... Um, why are all the most expensive teams in, in England doing so badly? <laughs> uh, so <laughs> it, it, apparently it, it, it isn't enough to have expensive players. So who, which one? David, are you going to uh, start? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have a go because it's, it's quite a long, there'd be quite a lot of debate in that, in that simple question. But I've got to say that I think it's great for football. My belief was that money wouldn't be the wouldn't be the way to success. Mm -hmm. I really wanted to believe, but for many years, like at Everton, mm -hmm. was knocking at the door, we couldn't get up, we couldn't quite make the Champions League, we couldn't quite, and I thought, we'll never do it because we don't have the money. It suddenly just had a little bit of reverse. Now we're all thinking, hey, wait a minute, we've all got a chance to do this now. And all those hopes, I'm saying, great, Leicester the ones, I wish it had been me at Everton, but Leicester have now done it. <clears throat> but I have to say that the money in the football, especially in the Premier League, and I heard you all talking so fondly about the Premier League, and, it, and it's great. Sometimes there's not much difference now between a £50 million player and a £20 million player. And you want to know, all the bottom teams in England can buy a £20 million player nowadays. They maybe can't buy the £50 million one, but there's not an awful lot of difference. The great stars in the world, we could all name the five or six top players in the world, are, of course, at a different level. But below that, there's not much difference between uh, someone at 50 million, 20 million. And that's why the Premier League is so exciting, because you can, you can do that. And uh, it's answered that as quickly as I can. But for me, the glory is really that money isn't the success to everything. Okay, Kevin? Yeah. Pretty similar, really. I, j I just think, that, you know, there's two ways to have the biggest building in town. You either build your own up or you knock everybody else's down. <laughs> and for years in England, yeah. you know, the big clubs, look at Man City, for example, who's a club that I love. I've managed for four years. They go and take players and they don't even play them. Chelsea have 32 players out on loan at other clubs. I mean, there's a greed factor about the big clubs that you know, we just keep buying, taking all the best. And David's right now, that even Newcastle this year when they go down, the parachute payment's 70 million pounds. There's so much money, thanks to people like yourselves taking it in Iceland and Qatar, that the clubs, clubs now can compete. I think Spain's a bit different where our friend's from because it's changed this year, but for years, Real Madrid and Barcelona shared it out and the others got about 20%. I think that's changing and that'll help Spanish football because you need more than two good teams. That, that's why the panel before said we like English football, because mm -hmm. anybody can be anybody. Yeah. In Spain, I know they can sometimes, but it doesn't happen very often. Mm. You know, so I think Spanish football will benefit from the sharing of the wealth. But it's still Real Madrid and Barcelona are gonna win the league. Mr. Calderon will say it's Real Madrid, but I'm gonna say it's Barcelona, because I don't like Real Madrid. But, <laughs> but I like Mr. Calderon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Can, I, I, I want to, do, can I just add yeah, one I sentence? I want to like to, Give both of you, Andre and Hadla, uh, final points now to jump into this before we wrap this up. I think I just want to say it in one sentence and to respond to Pieter's question. The empty pursuit of more has left few teams, businesses or societies intact long term. 
Thank you, Andre. Those words of wisdom. Oh, yeah, um, <laughs> that's a presidential now. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, <laughs> what, what we're, in <laughs> we're, in, we're in football. It might take us a while to work that one out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to you on that one. <laughs> 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 Can you we'll write we'll, it down we'll have yeah. a private talk. Andre, I'm going to give you the final words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. That's good. Because I'm, I'm, I'm quite a simple man. And, and my only mission is to sell more. So make sure you buy my products. <laughs> drink a lot of my beer tonight. Uh, yeah. And during Eurovision, you know, over the, the weekend. So yeah, cheers. Yeah. So it's football time and Eurovision time here in Europe. But thank you all. Uh, it has been amazing points that you've been giving us. Talking about uh, many leaders, honestly, honesty, keep going. You're not going to be liked all the time. Trust your people and pick your people and passion. So this is the takeaway that we have from, from this panel. I'd like to thank you for joining us. And but, you know, uh, we have an introduction for the next person, but thank you very much. Thank you.